Hi, welcome to week five, chapter four of facial muscles and expressions. Today we're going to uh, take a look at uh, the muscles um, that are in the, in the cranium and uh, we'll see how that applies to video games. So let's go ahead and get started. How are video game expressions enhanced by facial expressions? So as we go through this chapter, keep in mind how video game characters and storylines can be enhanced by the proper displaying of facial expressions. So here's an example that you see. There's great emotion being displayed here in the character. All right, so let's take a look now of the muscles of the face. Here's an anterior view. I won't be going over all the different muscles here, but uh, you can see um, all the muscles of the uh, frontal region of the face here being displayed. We have uh, circular and strap-like muscles. Uh, we have muscles that are covered by layer of subcutaneous tissue. There are many different considerations when drawing these muscles. And uh, when we're drawing the face, and we have to think about what is the shape of the hair? What is the shape of the head? How much flesh does somebody actually have on their face? And obviously, um, some people have, uh, have more fatty tissue in their face, and then some people have less fatty tissue in their face. Uh, many people have wrinkles especially older people. The older you get, the more wrinkles you're going to have. And uh, muscles, the, um, the continued use over years and years of uh, facial muscles can contribute or actually cause wrinkles to appear in the face. And we'll take a look at some of those and we even have named some of those. So we'll find out what their names are as well. And uh, also muscle attachments. Um, we'll talk about where the muscles actually attach in the cranium. So. Uh, we'll take a look at all these different muscles that you see here in the actual um, in the actual uh, face area. All right, let's go ahead and uh, move on. All right, so attitude. Um, the head. We can tell by the way the head is held um, that a person what their attitude is. And uh, somebody who holds their head up high, that's a, that gives confidence. It shows them that they, they're having confidence. Someone who holds their head low, they could be sad, they could be depressed. Um, they might not be very confident about their situation, a lack of confidence. So different ways that the head is held. Um, and even movement, if someone's looking around a lot, looking left, looking right, um, looking all around, that could uh, give the feeling of suspicion and so they're being suspicious or maybe they're, uh, they're un unaware or unsure of their surroundings. Um, so attitude is very important. Quality of the eyes, um, a hint of emotion on facial features, and then there's other subtle factors that we'll talk about as well that the muscles of the face all contribute to. Facial expressions. So here we see um, the study of facial expressions and their movement. So the study of facial expressions is actually essential for any artist, um, especially for animators, storyboard artists, comic book artists, illustrators, fine artists, and I'm going to add to that video game artists. We kind of include that when we talk about animators, but um, video game artists, it becomes crucial, especially now that um, our hardware, our software, um, everything has gotten so good that we can now show many detailed facial expressions in our video games. Whereas uh, previously, 10, 15 years ago, not that long ago, um, we still only had just a few facial expressions, but now we can get lots of details and show some really fine emotion. So the artist has to work to achieve a sense of narrative and expressiveness with figurative work, and it's important for the artist to understand muscle and soft tissue placement for forensic artists. So we want to make sure that we understand um, what causes the lines around the eyes, the lines around the mouth, the nose, um, the, the forehead. Where, where do these wrinkles come from? What causes them? What muscles are causing them? What expressions um, are the muscles causing to happen? And, uh, and we have to know all this information. So we're going to take a look at all that today. Um, facial muscle movement. So the skeletal muscle in our face um, usually attaches on one bone. And then normally skeletal muscle will cross over a joint. And then it will attach to a second bone. Think about your elbow for a moment where your bicep um, attaches on one bone. It crosses 
um, over your uh, elbow joint and then it, when it contracts it uh, lifts your arm up and so a muscle has to cross over a joint in order to affect the bone or in order to move the bone. Well in our face um, this same thing does not apply um, to facial movement. So we've only got one um, bone really, the cranium. Well we also have the mandible and uh, so we have two bones that, uh, that are in the cranium and uh, not all of the muscles um, cross over a joint. So we'll see how that happens. Muscles will usually be attached um, either to some soft tissue or they'll be attached to the cranium or the mandible and, uh, and pull the, the skin, the tissue of the skin, or we'll be pulling the, the mandible up or down or sideways. We'll look more at that as well. All right, so the skull is the attachment side for most of these facial muscles. And again, they don't cross over a joint, and they'll attach to soft tissue structures. If you're making faces, you can actually feel your muscles in your face as you tighten them up, in your cheeks, um, even in your jaw as you're chewing um, gum, food, as you're talking, um, as you're getting angry and clenching your teeth. You can actually feel those muscles harden up as they contract. Um, a contraction will cause the soft forms in our face to move and that creates our expressions. And then they, uh, they move these um, facial features, eyebrows, eyelids, lips, skin, mouth, cheeks, those things, and then they're moved in certain ways to create the expressions in our face. So we have, uh, they'll cause uh, skin creases called expressive lines and they occur in the areas of facial expressions. For an example, when the forehead muscle contracts, um, it raises our eyebrows, causing creases on our forehead. And uh, in young people, when we do this, when we contract those forehead muscles and we get those wrinkles, in young people, the wrinkles disappear as soon as the contraction is finished. But in old people, because that's happened time and time again over years and years, those lines remain. We call those worry lines, laugh lines, crow's feet, frown lines. Um, there are a lot of different um, names that we give to these uh, lines that are caused on our on our face over time and uh, over repetitive use. Here are we're going to take a look at some facial muscle groups and uh, you'll see that they are color coded. Orange at the top is the forehead muscle group and then under that the orbital muscle group, nasal, oral muscles uh, in the upper group, the oral muscle group, and then oral muscles in the lower group. So these groups are, according to facial regions, that they influence most significantly. And that's how they're grouped. And uh, we'll take a look at how each of these muscle groups work together in order to create the expressions that we have. So let's take a look here at the forehead muscle group. And uh, the forehead muscle group is located on the frontal bone of the cranium. Um, it consists of the frontalis, the procerus, and the corrugator supercilii muscles. These muscles move the eyebrows and the forehead skin. And the frontalis is a thin muscle in the forehead region. And I'm going to pull out my marker here, my pointer. And uh, I'll just give my, I guess my highlighter here so you can kind of see some of these things. So the frontalis, as you can see it right there, it's this big muscle on your forehead. And if you touch your own forehead and kind of uh, uh, get your angry eyes or, or move your eyes up. You can feel that muscle moving in your forehead. Then you'll see the procerus and that muscle is kind of in between your eyes and just a little bit uh, above the bridge of your nose there. And if you do what's called wrinkling your nose, you can feel that muscle contracting in there as it pulls down um, on there. So we see the frontalis pulls up, the procerus pulls down, um, in those muscles right there. So the mu those muscles, they move the eyebrows, they move the forehead skin, um, and they have two sides on either side of the midline. So you can actually see the midline right here. If you can see my, uh, let's see if I can switch to a, a red pen here. And uh, here's our midline drawing. And you can see that on either side we have muscles, uh, the frontalis muscle there. So this creates expressions of sadness, sorrow, grief, and worry. In our forehead, we have um, different expressions that are created. Here we see some examples where the eyebrows are elevated upward. 
and that can be um, things like surprise. Um, it could be uh, uh, expressions where both eyes are open, we're in awe. And uh, the corrugator supercilii, these are two small muscles positioned at a slight angle beneath the orbicularis oculi muscle. It originates on the inner end of the brow ridge of the frontal bone, inserts into the forehead skin over the middle of the eyebrow, and when it contracts, it lowers the inner ends of the eyebrows, making wrinkles in a vertical direction near the root of the nose. Now here we also see uh, on the right side, um, if we're just contracting one frontalis muscle, not both sides, if we're just doing one side, then you can see, I'm going to highlight again, then you can see this one side right here, we get a different look. So when one side goes up, it wrinkles the forehead skin here, and it gives us kind of a, a suspicious look or a maybe a confused, but not really confused, but more of a, oh really type of look. And uh, here's a couple familiar faces that use this very effectively that we've seen through the, uh, through the last few years. So here's an example. We see on the left, we see The Rock, who's famous for that raised eyebrow. And then on the right, we see Spock, who also is famous for a raised eyebrow. And uh, he's kind of given us that, oh, really, look, as if he's not quite sure he believes the information that's being presented there. So anyway, um, actors have known to use um, this um, eyebrow raise very effectively to create a certain, they're communicating a certain emotion or a certain expression. All right, another one um, that I found that I thought was kind of fun, if we go back just one moment here, just to get a quick look, we see the, the forehead is being wrinkled. We see these uh, great lines in the forehead right here. And uh, there was an actor, Frankie Muniz, and uh, when he's uh, kind of upset, when he's frustrated, and when he's uh, reached his point there, you can see that uh, he gets these lines in his forehead right there. And instead of coming all the way across his forehead, these lines are just created kind of in the center of his forehead. And uh, it's kind of a meme. It is a meme on the internet where Frankie Muniz gets great reception because he uh, gets that Wi-Fi look. All right, moving on. Here's uh, some more expressions that we see where here in the left image, the inner eyebrows are elevated. Um, and keep in mind that's inner eyebrows are elevated slightly. The frontalis muscle has the inner portion here is contracting. There's that Wi-Fi that we saw in Frankie Muniz right there. We see that Wi-Fi right there. And then some people also get these lines to the right and the left there, those diagonal lines. And uh, we might call this um, knitting the eyebrows. So here you see intense concentration, concern, disapproval, annoyance, a state of confusion, and uh, knitting the eyebrows. The corrugator supercilii might bulge in some faces when it's contracting. Um, the procerus is a small fan-shaped muscle in the lower central region of the forehead. Remember we talked about that's between the eyes right above the bridge of the nose there. And then also it starts at the bridge of the nose and fascia inserts into the skin of the lower region of the forehead between the eyebrows and uh, kind of creates the angry face. Uh, or a face uh, maybe displeased, something like that. Here we see, uh, moving on, we'll see the eye muscles. Now, there is an orbital muscle group here. Uh, it includes the orbicularis oculi and the depressor supercilii muscles. These muscles help move the eyelids and portions of the eyebrows. And there's several muscle strips here called extrinsic eye muscles or extraocular muscles in the back of the orbital cavity eye movement is extremely important in characters. And uh, when you're animating as an animator and you are um, trying to get the character to look at a certain thing, we always want to move the eyes first before moving the head to look at the character. And obviously there's going to be some exceptions to the rule. But the idea is that the eyes lead the head. So wherever the eyes look, then the head will follow afterwards. So eye movement does become very important, and it's important to know which muscles are moving the eyes when this happens. Here we see all the extrinsic eye muscles right here. I'm not going to go over all of them because you can see them right here. But just be aware how important eye movement is to uh, artists, animators, um, and uh, video game modelers, riggers. 
some more muscles here. Uh, muscles move the eye in various directions. They have elevation, depression, abduction, and adduction. So remember these terms, elevation moving upward, depression moving them downward, um, abduction moving the eye outward, and adduction moving the eye towards the center line of the body, moving it toward the center. So we can also move upward medially or laterally, downward medially or laterally, and also if you open your eyes wide open, you get what we call that deer in headlight look. And that's caused by the levator palpebrae superior uh, muscle. So levator palpebrae superior. Let me see if I can highlight that for you right there. So levator palpebrae superioris, and, uh, and that causes the eyelid, the upper eyelid to move um, upward, opening the eyes wide open, giving you that deer in headlight look. Eyeball movement becomes extremely important, um, not just in animations, but now also in video game characters. Now that we have the ability to have um, fairly high resolution characters, we can have some pretty intricate eye movements. And uh, it's getting better and better every single year as the hardware and software allows. Um, animators, the, um, the technique is there, and also the, uh, the training is there. So it's really just a matter of being able to have the, the hardware be able to keep up with it. So eyeball movement is created by extrinsic muscles. Um, and the iris tells the direction the eye is looking. As we can see over here, this picture, um, movement of the eyeball. Um, the top picture is looking medially or adduction. And it's looking laterally um, uh, abduction. So we can see it looking to the left, looking to the right. Um, the eye there. Um, and so the iris tells the direction the eye is looking and the shape of the iris changes depending on the direction. Now the shape doesn't really change in the person. It changes because of the angle that you're looking at the iris. Think about if you had a, if you had a, um, uh, a circle on a piece of paper and you were looking at the paper right, straight on and then you took the paper and kind of turned it at an angle it would not look completely circular anymore. It would look more elliptical. So, uh, so the shape of the iris changes depending upon the direction, and it's not the shape, it's kind of a, it's an illusion. It's an optical illusion there. So straight ahead, it's a circle. When we look at it to the side, it's more elliptical. So here you can see the drawing of how it turns kind of elliptical instead of being circular right there. And here, when it's up and down, elevated or depressed, uh, it retains a little bit more of its circular form. Muscles of the iris. So the iris does change here. Look, up. the iris is that actual little black center part of our eye. And uh, here we have the cornea right here. And, uh, but this is the, the iris is right inside there. And we're gonna take a look at the, the muscles of the iris. Light enters the iris, and uh, two muscles will either expand or contract. And uh, these are not skeletal muscles. They don't attach to the skeleton. These are smooth muscles. And uh, the circular muscle of the iris is what we're looking at. Um, it contracts to reduce the size of the pupil that we can see here in the middle, in the middle um, image. And then uh, the radial muscle of the iris, it contracts and dilates the pupil, as we can see down here in the bottom picture. And so they cannot both contract at the same time. And you can't even control this muscle. Like your bicep, you can control that. When you're picking something up, you tell your arm, pick that up, and you have control over it. But you don't have control over these, uh, over these muscles here of the iris. If you go out, on a, you're in the house, you go outside on a bright sunny day, and the light, um, too much light filters in there, and so the iris contracts automatically closing that little, to make it just a small little hole right there. And then if you've been outside for a while and your eyes have adjusted to the bright light, and then you go inside your house and it's a little bit darker in there, the iris is going to expand greatly in order to let more light in so that you can see inside um, where there's not as much light as there was outside. And so these are opposing um, contractions and so that's why they cannot contract at the same time is because they're opposing contractions. All right next um, the orbicularis oculi and the depressor supercilii. 
we can see these muscles around the eyes and uh, look at the different look at the arrows here and you see the different directions that the uh, muscle is pulling so even though it's a circular muscle around the eye it's round it's orb like um, it still pulls towards the center of the eye and uh, there's two main sections here there's an outer section uh, it's an orbital portion surrounds the outer eye socket and then there's an intersection, the palpebral portion, which lies within the eyelids in there. And, uh, but they all contribute to blinking, to squinting, um, to opening up, uh, opening wide. So uh, the arrows indicate the direction of the muscular contraction. All right, the orbital muscle group here, it aids in closing the eyelids. Here we see two different images. Uh, the one on the left where the eyelids are squeezed tightly shut and uh, there's a difference between just closing your eyes gently and squeezing them tightly and here this uh, this uh, model we're looking at this drawing shows because the reason it looks like they're tightly shut the eyes here is if you look at the lines on the outside of the eyes those lines are created because those muscles are pulling so tightly that those creases those wrinkles form because of the the tightness of the muscle being um, squeezed shut or the eyes being squeezed shut there. And so uh, it gives us a better look at, oh, this person is, uh, is shutting their eyes hard or squeezing. Whereas you can just close your eyes and not get those, those lines in there, but it's not as powerful as of an expression if, unless the lines are there. And then also the levator palpebrae superioris muscle, um, where the whole muscle is contracting and then the upper eyelids are elevated and, uh, and again, not with the frontalis muscle because we don't see the lines there. Um, it's just a smooth forehead. And so, uh, so uh, this uh, orbital muscle group here, two different when it's closed or when they're open. The nasal muscle group, there's two main muscles here, the nasalis, uh, two triangular muscles on both sides of the nose and joined by a fiber strip. And if you take a look at the picture here, you can see what direction the arrows are pointing the direction of muscular contraction. So when you when we do what's called wrinkling the nose or uh, turning your nose up, um, you, you would uh, contract these muscles here. But look at the directions. They're going upwards. These uh, uh, levator labii superiors, they're pulling upwards. And then the nasalis muscle uh, is pulling inward up towards kind of the, the base or the, uh, I guess the, uh, the top of the nose there. They're pulling upward. So two elongated muscular strips along either side of the nose. All right, we said it's wrinkling or crinkling of the nose in disgust or revulsion. Um, if you smell something that is very displeasing or it's just not uh, what you expected, then usually a lot of times we'll wrinkle our nose in disgust uh, with that. But here we can see uh, and again, look at this, the, the eyes contribute, the eye muscles are contributing a little bit here because we see the, the wrinkles in the eyes again, at the edges of the eyes. So it's not just, when this expression, it's not just these nose muscles that are contracting to form this. Uh, we're also getting a little bit of uh, orbicularis um, eye muscle movement in there as well. All right, the oral muscle group. And uh, this, we have several muscles that affect the lips and the mouth. The main muscle here is the orbicularis oris, which contains the lips. And uh, the oral muscles are the upper group, and they pull the upper lip upward. And the oral muscles in the lower group pull the lower lip downward. And uh, we use these muscles when we're talking, when we're chewing, and uh, when we're just kind of expressing some emotion of some kind. There is a horizontal muscle there called the buccinator and it pulls the outside corners of the mouth horizontally. That's buccinator. And so over here in the picture, we see the buccinator, which is just to the sides of the mouth there, and uh, pulls the outside corners. And so if you're, uh, if you're smiling, your buccinator is going to be uh, used, and then also the orbicularis oris. And so it pulls the mouth, and, uh, and our lips can get pulled upward, towards the nose and towards the upper part of the face there. And then also our lip gets pulled downward. Not as common to pull the lip downward, uh, maybe just a little bit, depending on what you're saying or chewing 
or, uh, or the movement there. Here we uh, see a couple pictures where the orbicularis oris with the whole muscle contracting and the lips are pursed. And so this creates, this has got a couple different uses here. Let's take a look at this. And uh, this is called the kissing muscle, the orbicularis oris. As you can see, the lips are pursed or puckered up, ready for a, a kiss, uh, pursing the lips. We also use this um, when we whistle. Some people um, protrude their lips like this and whistle. And uh, also, it can be a moderate surprise when we're, ooh, when we're, uh, when we're surprised about something, when we're ooing at the fireworks. Um, also, if you remember the scene from Toy Story, when uh, Woody goes into the, into the video game there, uh, where all the little three-eyed aliens are in there, and he starts talking to them, and all of them, all at once, they go, ooh, and that's their, that was their orbicularis oris. Now, their mouths were a lot wider, so their mouth actually had that contraction, that pucker. It moved across from one side of their face to the other side of their face. Just kind of a, a fun little animator trick to add to the entertainment value. So this muscle also assists us in chewing and in speech. So uh, here we see on the left side, upper and lower lips are pursed. And then on the right side, we see upper and lower lips press tightly together. Now, um, pressing tightly together, uh, a child might do that in order to refuse eating something, eating or drinking something that they think might uh, not taste well. And so they put their lips together tightly. Other reasons we might put our lips tightly together like that, um, if you play a musical instrument, especially a brass instrument. Let's take a look here at our next slide. And so uh, this is called the trumpeter's muscle there. As you're pursing your lips tightly together, we're going to use this buccinator. Now the buccinator is, let me uh, get my, there it is. The buccinator, remember we said, is at the corners of the mouth. And so it's going to be pulling back away from the corners of the mouth, stretching the mouth tightly. And when that whole muscle contracts, um, then it compresses the cheeks, pulls the lips tightly across the teeth. It's also, some people have dimples and, uh, and it can create those dimples as well. Some people don't have dimples. And uh, I'm just making a guess here. That may be um, depend on the attachment site for the buccinator and on different people where if it's attached even within millimeters, um, it could create the, um, the dimples, or if it's attached in a different spot, even just a couple millimeters away, you don't get that, that little dimple on the cheek there. Um, the buccinator can also give us expressions such as smirking, sarcasm, contempt, and I mentioned if you play a brass instrument, a trombone, a trumpet, um, things like that, that is the, called the trumpeter's muscle right there. You purse your lips tightly together and uh, you want to restrict the flow of air from your lips and uh, the buccinator aids in doing that. And so, uh, and so that is the trumpeter's muscle. All right, we have the oral muscles upper group here. It elevates the upper lip and expressions include contempt, disgust, disdain. So our oral muscles here, you can see the arrows pulling and there's several different uh, muscles that are being pulled here. The levator labii superioris, the zygomaticus minor, and the zygomaticus major. And we'll take a look at some of these, what these do. But the arrows indicate the direction of the muscular contraction. Notice that they're actually pulling away from the mouth and they're pulling upward. So you can flex those muscles. We kind of think of those as our cheek muscles or our cheek bone muscles. And so when you are rigging a character to get facial expressions out of them, um, think about the placement. And you'll have to work and adjust your placement as an animator, as a facial rigger and animator, in order to get those expressions just correct there. Because we do want contempt, disgust, disdain. We want our video game characters to be able to show those detailed emotions as they go through the experience in the game. It adds to the entertainment value and, uh, and it helps the player to kind of feel what that character is, is uh, feeling as well as what they're going through. All right, next. Um, here we see um, 
only one side contracting for a lip snarl. Now, this is known as the Elvis sneer, but Billy Idol, back in the 80s, he had this sneer right there. And, and Elvis, he also used to do the little lip thing. And uh, But Billy Idol, I think he mastered it and did a great job of it. Here you can see that lip is just pulling up there on his uh, on his left side. So, uh, so it's a great... It's kind of like we saw The Rock and Spock doing their eye lift. Here is the, uh, here's the, the lip lift or the lip snarl. And so uh, I wonder what, and you can see Billy Idol kind of gets the, the left eye maybe up a little bit when he's given the, the lips curl there. But I um, wonder if you could do the lip snarl and lift your eye at the same time. Something fun to practice. Oral muscles. Uh, here's the upper group. We're going to take a look at some studies of these. Here we see where the upper lip elevates, and uh, again, maybe a, a, that guy looks like he just smelled something bad. He's got a bad taste in his mouth. He saw something that, that was revolting to him. Um, and then on the right side, where the upper lip elevates only on one side, that's uh, kind of a uh, maybe a confused face, or uh, he's got this look as like, what? What's going on here? And uh, so a little bit of confusion maybe, not quite understanding what's going on, that, uh, that look of uh, not fully comprehending uh, what's going on at that time. Now, let's, uh, we saw these muscles here, the levator labii superioris, zygomaticus minor, and the zygomaticus major. Here's the zygomaticus minor. It pulls the upper lip and the nasolabial fold. And it's a slender muscle positioned near the zygomaticus major. And you can see it's this purple muscle right in there, right in between the two. And it pulls upward. It aids in, in contracting and pulling that muscle upward. The zygomaticus major. It's that long muscular strip position close to the zygomaticus uh, <laughs> minor. Not seen on the surface, it's called the smile muscle. And it contracts to pull on the outer corners of the mouth producing a smile. And here we see uh, in the images the zygomaticus minor and major contracting slightly together. The outside corners of the mouth elevate slightly and it causes a closed lip smile. So we get this closed lip smile in there. We don't see any teeth. Um, the mouth is closed, there's, a, there's no opening right there, and it's kind of just a, a general pleasantness is what it's looking like. Then in the middle picture, um, where they're both the minor and major are contracting moderately, the outside corners of the mouth elevate, and now we see teeth in the smile. And uh, so this is an open mouth smile where we see teeth. And then the last one on the right side, where they're both fully contracting and the outside corners of the mouth elevate, we see the full set of teeth that causes uh, what's called an expansive grin. Um, look at the lines on the face as well. The lines run all the way up from the nose, the wings of the nose, down below the mouth towards the chin. And then here we can also see the dimples starting to really come into play as well. Um, the eyes also add to this expression, but we're just talking about the mouth right now, but it's important to realize that the eyes um, contribute to expressions when other parts of the face are uh, being expressive as well. So, all right, let's also move on to the oral muscles in the lower group here. And uh, they're located below the orbicularis oris, and they depress the lower lip. And these muscles are triangular shaped. If you can, uh, you can see these, here's the red in those little red muscles there, the depressor labii inferioris. Uh, and the term inferioris does not mean that they are any less than the other muscles. It just means that they are below the other muscles. They're inferior because they're not superior. Superior basically means above and inferior means below. And we've actually talked about that in the, some of the previous uh, episodes that we did. So just to, as a reminder. Um, and then we have the depressor anguli oris, the depressor labii inferioris, and then the mentalis there at the bottom. So the contraction draws the corners of the mouth downward, and it causes downward folding of the skin. So think about you're not moving your jaw here, you're just moving the lip, um, the lip and the chin muscles. So... Um, they aid, they don't really, I don't know if they really uh, uh, make an expression all of their own. Um, we'll take a look. They usually, if, you, if somebody gets really sad and you see their chin start to quiver, um, these muscles are affected in that way. And sometimes we can't even help it. 
um, because the emotion is so strong um, that you're feeling that those muscles just start taking over and begin to quiver. So here in the example we see this, uh, this character has deep sadness, deep sorrow, disappointment. It's a very intense contraction. It causes a grimace or a look of horror. And, uh, and a lot of times we don't like to have express those sad emotions because um, it causes all of these wrinkles and we can't control it. And sometimes we people just think, you know, we don't look very, we don't look very pleasant when we're expressing a, a, a sad emotion like that. So anyway, the outer corners of the mouth are pulled downward. And look at all these lines it creates here. Uh, um, in the chin area, all the way around the mouth, the lower lip, and here the lower lip is actually even pouting or sticking out just a little bit there. And uh, again, because these muscles are contracting fully, we see those lines coming all the way, all the way up from the wings of the nose there, and then uh, coming around down and towards the bottom uh, underneath the lip there. And then you can see lots of dimpling in the chin as well because that muscle is fully contracting. And then on the right image, we see the lower lip projects outward and downward um, when the whole muscle is contracting as well there. So, And here um, we're taking a look at the mentalis. Uh, when the whole muscle is contracting, it's a pair of V-shaped muscles located in the chin region. The contraction causes pouting. And then there's a lot of emotions that we um, that we have with this: defiance, anger, doubt, sadness, uh, determination. Depending on the rest of the facial expression, whatever your um, including eye movement with this, eye expressions um, included with this would really contribute to whatever the expression is you're you're trying to get. So here we see the chin elevates a little bit, the lower lip projects outward. Um, and down in a pouting expression. Look at the wrinkles there in the chin. Um, There's some definite lines around the mouth and around the chin. And it kind of forms a ball at the chin, like a wrinkled ball at the chin there when that muscle is, uh, is contracting. And uh, so we've taken a look now at all, the, all these muscles, facial muscles contributing to expressions and uh, so what is the importance then of facial expressions in video games? So here you can see this is a uh, video game character. Um, the kind of things we, we get the, the importance there is the player, um, you, who are controlling your avatar, you get to understand what the avatar is feeling, that's sympathy, when you can understand what they're feeling. Or what about something even stronger is empathy, when you, the player, can actually feel, you're, you're feeling the same way that your avatar is feeling. That's empathy, when you feel what they're feeling. And, uh, and that can happen when that experience is very strong. You've invested a lot of time in your game, in your characters, in the progression, um, in your player, the, everything that you've earned, that you've worked hard to earn. And so, uh, so when something happens to your player or, or your, your character, your avatar, or something happens to someone the avatar is close to, then you can have those same feelings. And then also in communication, where you understand, well, it's understanding is sympathy, but knowing what that avatar is feeling, it's being communicated. The feeling is being communicated. It also aids in the suspension of disbelief. And, uh, and that's so important in immersing yourself in the game. We want to have that immersion. It also adds to the realism to see these detailed face, facial expressions and it provides a better emotional experience for the player as well. And that's important. And uh, to a game developer, you want the players to have that better emotional experience because if they do, there's a better chance they'll play the game again. They'll have, it has replay, it adds to replay value and they'll tell their friends about it what a great experience it was even though it may have been a hard emotional experience it was still a very good emotional experience they'll tell their friends and then their friends will go and play the game purchase it buy it and uh, want to play the game as well so many ways that facial expressions um, can contribute to video games and then also here you can see in the picture itself it's a close-up camera shot 
And when we have these detailed expressions that we're capable of creating now, then we want to get the close-ups of that and be able to see it up close. Um, it just provides a better, again, a better emotional experience. And then lastly, how emotionally invested are you when you play games? So there are, um, if you go online and kind of look at, um, if you were to Google, you know, what video games made me cry, uh, many gamers report having cried after playing certain video games. You may have also experienced that same thing. And uh, I've had many students talk about Final Fantasy VII, um, how it just made them, they got to the end, they cried. Um, and even lately, Final Fantasy XV, many people have reported crying um, at the end of Final Fantasy XV. Uh, Metal Gear Solid Three. Um, and four. There's uh, some scenes in there that would make you cry. Shadow of the Colossus, Whisper, World 2, and then Gears of War 2 when Dom finds Maria and she's just like a shell of her former self. And so, uh, so there's these emotional experiences that we have and we get to see um, the facial expressions of these characters as well. And so, uh, so think about what games have you played where the characters facial expressions helped you to have a better game playing experience. You can take this this knowledge, this experience that you have now and when you go to become either a conceptual artist, a, uh, a rigger, an animator, or even just a game player, a storyteller, um, all of these facial expressions, this emotional investment now will add to you as a game developer. So, and that is the end of our lecture. And uh, thank you for looking at Chapter 5 um, and the importance of facial expressions in games.